We're live in the morning, the morning motivation show. I am back for, for all your motivational needs. So make sure to go out and get your projects done. I'm going to try to get something done today. I'm actually going to get things squared away on the L78. I'm going to order the camshaft, probably have the guys at either Schneider or Bullet get that thing going because they said that they can make a, they have masters for the, the actual factory specs on the camshaft. So I'm not going to get something. Comp has stuff, but it's not a direct replacement for it. It's an updated version of it. And I don't really want that. I want an original solid flat tap it factory spec camshaft. I'd like to find an old one, but I just haven't been able to do it. So it's time just to make one and I'll get one made. But I'm going to get things prepped for, because organization is the key to success. I'm going to get things prepped so that I can uh, assemble a short block. I just want to take another look at the block and heads and see if I need to put another coat of paint on them and then get some of the paint off of the machine stuff. So, because I didn't do a fantastic job of masking those off. <laughs> I just used the old cardboard guide trick while I was painting, but it's now getting warm enough. Yesterday was about 70 or 71 or something. So it was warm enough during the day to where I would feel like I could paint those and, and have it work out again. So let me, let me know uh, for, for you guys, um, do, when your guys are uh, putting together a new motor, when you're prepping the block, do you guys use a glip tall in the, in the valley and in the, you know, to shed, to shed the oil? Here are my thoughts about that. And that's not what we're going to talk about. We're actually going to talk about the intake, intake manifolds today, but here are my thoughts on that. Obviously, guys have been doing it since way back in the day. All the old school guys are, do it, and they put the glyph doll on it so that it's basically a painted surface so that it helps the oil run back down and, and come back down to the pan. That That's a good idea if oil drain, obviously, is your issue. Do you have an issue with that? You know, a lot of guys also like to put screens in all of the oil drains and they'll epoxy screens in so that if you get, you know, break a rocker, that kind of stuff, it picks up the big pieces. It doesn't help with bearing material, which is, I think, normally probably the failure thing. But um, they do that, and they put the glip ball on it, and so it helps with oil drain back. My question is, and I'd like to see if anybody has any data on this, I'd like to see if coating the surface of the block um, stops some of the, does it make it run hotter? Does it stop some of the heat uh, shedding of the iron? Does it limit that? Does it help it? <laughs> I, I, in my mind, I think it would make things worse, um, just like coating any surface, unless you specifically coat it with something that is a, um, that actually aids in um, heat rejection uh, or heat dissipation, basically, and which is be very, very specific. But I don't think that the Glyptol stuff. I think that the the Glyptol is actually an insulator, and and I. So I don't know if that's a positive thing or a negative thing. We know it's a positive thing for oil drain back and on, on issues where you would have more oil drain back would be a problem and running the pan dry, especially on factory kind of pans. Um, maybe that would be an issue. It does look cool. It makes the block look better when you're when you have it all and you're presenting it to all, all your buddies like, oh, look at this. This is, this is super awesome. It looks good. And it does look really good. And it does help the oil drain. But my question is, what do you guys think about that? Do you think it, um, guys have put together lots of these motors? Have, has anybody ever done any real testing on that? Or if there's any testing out there in internet land, please let me know. I, I'd like to read about that and find out if that's really something. I myself just let, like to leave that stuff, like to leave the, you know, you can knock the edges off and when you're doing block prep and all that's good. But I, I like, I don't like to paint the inside. I just like to paint the outside. <laughs> and really I like to paint the outside and most of these just black because that way it doesn't show any oil leaks and it works out better. But because this is an old school, original 396, uh, 375 horse 396, it's got to be Chevy orange because it's going to have all of the, the factory things on it, the factory, you know, stamp steel timing cover and, and pan and all that stuff, just, just to get things started with it. And then maybe we'll do some, some funner things. One of the things I am going to do, which I'm sure that they wouldn't have done in the factory, is I'm going to knock the sharp edges off of the pistons that's more of a detonation thing than anything else. And, and honestly, if you, it's something you'd be easily to cure, easy to cure even back in the day, especially when we had, you know, much higher octane fuel from the pump. So that's not an issue. I just would like to do it now for more modern times, just, you know, knock the sharp edges off these high dome pistons because they have big domes in them because on a 396 to make the compression that you have to make, 
with the stat with the factory chamber size of a factory rec core head of a 219 head, you have to have a big dome on it. And the, and the and all these factory ones did. So it will be interesting. Um, I, I'm excited about putting that together. I'm excited about running a 396. It'll be a fun deal. I'm sure Brule will be happy about it because he's really he's really a big block guy. And this is this is right up his like muscle car alley. So be, that will be very, very cool. And then maybe we'll upgrade it and make it better than it than it than it was because it's pretty easy to improve upon whatever the factory rating is. I mean, the head the heads have enough flow to support, you know, 550 or 600 horsepower fairly easily. And then the factory camps have obviously nowhere near ideal. I like the fact that it does have compression, and that would be good. Um, but honestly, if I was doing it, it wouldn't be a 396. It would be more likely to be a 496 um, because it's just going to make more power everywhere. And it would have good aluminum heads on it, so you don't have to worry about it. And it wouldn't be 11 to 1. 11 to 1, the, like the 11 to 1 and 12 to 1 range kind of put it in, uh, like we talked to Brule, he's like, that's no man's land. Why would you do that? If you're going to put compression in it, put compression in it. Put 13 or 14 to 1 in it. Make it a compression motor. Otherwise, don't make it a compression motor. Don't put enough compression in it where you have to run good gas in it, but you're not getting all the benefits from the really high compression. Or just don't put the compression in it, then you can run, you know, if you want to run boots and stuff with it, which is what I do. When I put them together, they're normally 10 10 to one or so right in that range, because that's high enough to still be efficient in a, and they still make decent power. You can still run them on pump gas and you can run lots and lots of boost. If you, especially if you run E85 on them, which I like to do. But today we are going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about intake manifolds, specifically dual plane and single plane intake manifolds with respect to, um, with plate nitro systems. And the reason that I want to talk about that is because there's something that's happening with these that a lot of guys don't realize. And it actually took me a long time to realize it in my testing. And the reason that I found this out, and this was many years ago, but the reason that I found this out is because I always tend to run these motors, whether I run them boosted or with nitrous, we always run them NA as a starting point because we want to see what the original power output is and then what it is when we add the nitrous. Well, when we put a nitrous plate on, I also do another run after we run it NA the way that it is with the carburetor right on the intake manifold. This is especially the case on a dual plane and especially the case on a dual plane that has the divider that comes all the way up to the carburetor. So when the, when the divider is flush with the rest of the mounting pad, that's one thing. When it has a cut out a notch like an RPM air gap style, that's a different thing, but and here's what happens. When, so when we put a nitrous plate on, obviously the nitrous and the fuel go into the motor. Nitrous does its magic things and its magic elixir things. Adds a whole bunch of uh, free range oxygen molecules. And once they're released and to do their good things, they make, they make lots of power. So the amount of power gain that you get from nitrous is a function of the amount of nitrous that you add, which is a function of a couple things, the jetting and the how full the bottle is and the pressure supplied by the bottle, which is a temperature thing. So how much ever nitrous you blow into there, that's going to determine how much power you get. And then obviously tuning has an effect. Although when I did the test with Freiburger and Engine Masters, when I was a guest host on there, we did a test and we were surprised how little the <laughs> tune actually affected it because we ran it really, really rich. And then we leaned it out and then we ran it with uh, like pulling timing and then not pulling timing. And we're just like, it, it just wants to make what the nitrous wants to make, whatever the nitrous is that you have in there. It kind of wants to make that. There's a little bit of wiggle room there with the tune. Um, but the, the thing we want to talk about today is what happens when we put the nitrous plate on. So if I run a motor that has a dual plane intake manifold on it with a divider that comes all the way up flush with the mounting uh, flange of the, for the carburetor, that's a, that's a tr true like dual plane intake manifold. The one with the divider cut down is still a dual plane manifold, but it acts differently than one that has the full divider. What it does is tend to lose signal from the carburetor or to the carburetor down low and improve it up top. So it, 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 I, liked it, I liken it to a transition intake manifold between a true divided dual plane and a single plane. Now it acts more like a dual plane in terms of where it wants to make power and its average torque and all of that but yet it still loses a little bit down low traditionally and gains stuff up top. So, <coughs> excuse me. The same thing happens when we add a small, you know, like carb spacer, especially an open carb spacer. 
So we run an open carb spacer on a true divided dual plane. It starts acting more like the notched divider dual plane because you what you've done is now raise the carburetor up. The signal now is able the signal from each side of the intake manifold is a, actually drawing through all four of them. And so you've made it more of kind of a common plenum, which is what our cut, which is what our cutout divider also does. So this, uh, and so the, the nitrous plate all by itself, before we add nitrous and fuel from the nitrous plate, has an effect on the power curve. So when what, what we do is I'll run a motor the way that it is with the carburetor on the manifold, then I'll run it again with the nitrous plate without adding nitrous, then we'll run it again with the nitrous plate adding the nitrous, and then a lot of times we'll run it with different jet sizes and, and add different amounts of nitrous. So we'll add 75, 100, 125 shot, whatever, like on this, this inexpensive sniper plate that I had that we showed. Sometimes they're adjustable up to 150. Some of the bigger ones, depending on the solenoids that you use and the jetting that's available, you can get them to go up to, you know, maybe add a 300 shot on some of these. But the thing is that a lot of guys don't realize is that when you add this nitrous plate, especially to a true divided dual plane, you change the signal to the carburetor. So what will happen is when you put this nitrous plate on and you stomp on the gas at 2,500 RPM or 3,000 RPM, it's going to be lean. And so having that plate on there, it is going to require that you retune the motor for the nitrous plate for just driving around when you're not running the nitrous. And that's, a, that's something that a lot of guys don't realize. It's the same thing as you putting a carb spacer on there. If you put a, an open carb spacer on your dual plane intake manifold, it's going to change the signal to the carburetor and you're going to have to tune it. It's going to be much leaner down low. And it would probably be <laughs> possibly slightly richer up top, but a lot of times not. A lot of times it compensates up at the top, but it will definitely not compensate at the bottom. So you'll definitely have to change the jetting or if you're going to try to do it with air bleeds or transition circuits or however you're going to do it, it's definitely going to, this is where that Edelbrock carburetor would really come into play. It would be awesome. And I think I need to do this with an Edelbrock carburetor because having essentially four circuits on it, I think we could dial this thing in and make it work with a spacer at, you know, better in different RPM ranges. I think we could actually tune that carburetor for specific RPM ranges, something that we often can't do with other carburetors, despite the fact that guys tell you, oh no, high speed air bleeds, they just add fuel at high speeds. No, they don't. I've done, I've done high speed air bleeds a lot. But the the because of the things that they've done to the metering block in the and, and the design of the carburetor internally, the that Elbrock carburetor seems to be very, very receptive and has the ability to make changes in RPM specific ranges, which is very, very cool and very, and, and in my opinion, very unique. So I would team that with this, with, with the plate or with a carb spacer, and you should be able to get the thing that you want. But it's very important because when you, when you stomp on the gas and you, especially if you go to wide open throttle at lower engine speeds, it's going to be lean so much so that you could get lean misfires. You could get backfires from it because it could, it could go, it could go from, it could change by more than a full air fuel point. In fact, it could change one and a half to two air fuel points, depending on the, the exact combination. We've seen big changes going from just putting the plate on. Now, obviously, when you're dumping the nitrous and fuel in, you can cure all that, but you're not hitting that. You're used, normally like if you've got a, a motor that runs to 6,500 RPM, you're not hitting the nitrous at 3,000 RPM. You're not hitting it. Like right, some guys might be. And, and at the track, maybe they are. Maybe they're running it through the whole thing and then it's all okay. But when you are when you have this plate on, when you're driving around and you're not running the nitrous, you're not curing that, obviously. So you do have to take steps to cure what would be uh, a low-speed lean, possibly misfire, but a low-speed lean condition when you just put the plate on. So it's very important that you guys recognize that. And so I'm going to see uh, our, our poll today would be... Well, today is, have you run nitrous on a carbureted motor? So it'll be interesting to see if 
This may eliminate some of the people that only have only had EFI motors and not have, have not run carbureted motors. But that's very important. So you know that if you're putting it on, and the thing is, it's most necessary to tune this if you're putting an open spacer, an open uh, nitrous plate on a true divided dual plane. If you're putting it on uh, an RPM air gap style with a cut divider, and you've already tuned it for that, then it will work, then it will be fine. And if you're putting on a single plane, there's nothing that's gonna be necessary. There's no extra tuning that's gonna be necessary. You already have a big common plenum. The Quite honestly, on a single plane intake manifold, on a carbureted application, that intake manifold and the rest of the motor, specifically the carburetor, is not even gonna know that you put a plate on it. It's not gonna do hardly anything at all. If it does anything, it, it, I would be very surprised. A lot of times, carb spacers, especially a small quarter inch plate or half inch plate, is not going to affect the power at all, all by itself. It will just affect it once you add the nitrous on a single plane. On a dual plane with a cutaway divider, it, it's going to be less of a problem. The big change is going to be on a true divided dual plane. Um, so what would be interesting if the guys made uh, nitrous plates that were um, truly divided. So you could, you could continue with this dual plane design and not have to change. So if nitrous guys, if you're listening, <laughs> make nitrous plates specifically for true divided dual planes that maintain that. And it doesn't have to be very thick. I mean, you're talking about a half inch or whatever, but it'd be like a half inch spacer that comes all the way up with plates in it. And you could go crisscross or however you want to do it um, or spray it from the center divider, however you want to do it, but make it so that you could continue that because Putting an open spacer, an open nitrous plate on a true divided dual plane is definitely going to change the air fuel curve, especially down low. So let's see what you guys got going on this morning. Now that we've had our discussion on nitrous plates and what you're going to have to do to change it. Car peeps are in the in the house. Three and 33 today, a boosted for eight. Happy birthday. Uh, it ain't used to shed oil. I wish it was warm enough here to do some painting. Yeah, it is. It's nice. It's going to be nicer today. I fully polish the inside of my block. If not done right, it chips. Okay, that's good. Just open one up, but I polish it, and it also stops any sludge from forming. That's good. Yeah, if you take a Dremel and polish all that, that's that will do the same thing. Although, again... Polishing, <laughs> it can be argued, diminishes surface area. That diminishes cooling. So a lot of guys will tell you that too. We're this morning we're going to install the motor mounts on the '63 C10. Nice. LS swapped and dressed the '98 Chevy 305 with an air gap intake. It will like all that and EFI chrome valve covers, which are definitely going to add like 20 horsepower. So Marty, you figured out why you blew the oil seal seals out of the turbos. I have an iron block. The outside temperature was like negative five, negative 10 degrees cooler outside. The inside temps were plus two or five. It's so not really noticeable. I'm an industrial painter by trade. And anytime you coat steel, it has an effect depending on what it is. Yeah, that's that's my opinion too. Life tip when, <laughs> there's a life tip from Overbuilt. Life tip when anger strikes and engines <laughs> tricks you, the hammer always fixes the problem. And a bigger hammer fixes bigger problems. Marty has a couple of questions. Please ask away. Turbo 14's in the house. Can I run factory head studs again, or would you get a new set? What, what motor has factory head studs? Um, factory head bolts? Or he, head studs I reuse over and over and over. But I've never seen any that came from the factory. Thermal energy is retained or modified to cool depending on the product. Uh, Cleaters Godzilla around 8.30s on pump gas. Nice. I got so much blow by this pushing oil back in the drain. I was going to ask if you had pressure on that side, but um, sometimes that happens too when we have the oil drain um, on the wrong side of the spinning crankshaft. I've seen that happen. I like the hip treatment for aluminum heads. Yep. I haven't ever run heads that have had that done, but I remember talking to Brian about those. They, they do it on their high uh, 
horsepower turbo stuff. Does anyone know if they make a one-way valve that I can run in the turbo drain? Well, the problem is a one-way valve, if it has pressure on one side, I don't know if you're, you'd have to have actually more pressure on the other side to open it up. And that's how the valves work. The oil draining in there is probably not going to do that. Scott, you watch Calvin run the Volvo? Cool. I don't know if it's rings or not. I'm thinking it's got a broken ring land in between the oil rings because it still runs good. They they will run like that if you if you broke the ring land and that piece has just kind of stayed in there because it's got the rings on both sides of it. So it's got the cylinder wall on the other side and kind of seals it in there. But you can get um, more blow by them. You used to grind the lifter valley for oil drain back, which would still release heat to the oil. If you have an older block, make sure you have a groove in the rear of the cam journal for the oil flow. Yeah, because especially on the, on the 396. I, that's right. I need to see what year that block is. Yeah, Marty, you might you might have to pull it apart and see. Maybe try a leak down or a compression test and see if you can uh, isolate one cylinder. Does anybody make a four-hole nicer splice? That's what I was talking about. Some sort of divided deal or four-hole like um, the spacers that we see. You already have dash 10 drains in it, already bungs welded into the front. Top side of the pan, well above the oil line. Anyone here run a Gen 2 LT1? Did it, wants to know. Tim is in the house. I really don't want to run a check valve. I, I don't think a check valve is actually going to solve your problem. Uh, did it, that's a good point. Marty, check the, make sure that you have enough crankcase venting. Because you don't want it trying to vent through the oil return. It's got dual dash tens to a catch can. If you have dual dash ten vents coming from the valve covers or something, you shouldn't have too much um, crankcase buildup down there. Got to appreciate the genius behind a quadrajet. A quadrajet works really well, especially for drivability. Let's see. You didn't really want to run the check valve. It'd be nice enough it hurt again. Yeah, do, do a compression test or a leak down and see if one of the cylinders is actually hurt. Did you know you can run a 200 shot of nitrous without retarding timing on an aggressive tune if you use water methanol? And you can run a 200 shot without retarding timing if you have uh, enough octane too. Watt dash 10 adapters that screw into the oil fill and run two passenger side valve covers to vent each side. That should be enough. Calvin ran 920s in the Volvo. That's cool. Scott, is Calvin's, is that, is that motor, does that motor have an intercooler on it? Tim, can I send you an email later? Yes. I'm happy to help if I can. Bolted up the 4L85E last night. Good job, Scott. We used to paint the inside of the block and heads with the electric motor paint. Yeah, that's that Gliptol stuff that I was talking about. That's about a Nitrous Express mainline kit. I don't know what the mainline kit is. I'm not familiar with that name, but uh, Nitrous kits are good.
Uh, Nick, you want to know if there's a difference between the LM4 and the L? I don't think that there's a, if you're going to modify them, I don't think that there's a difference. That's an, the LM4 is an aluminum block though, right? Yeah, that's a, I think that the aluminum block is the only thing that you're thinking about or the only difference. I, I would pick an LM4 or over, or over an LM7. Hello, BTR torque cam doing an LQ4. I've run one in a six liter before. Uh, honestly, I think it might be a little small for a, for a six liter. I think I would lean more toward a Chuck Norris cam on a six liter, but it will definitely make a lot more power than the stock cam does. Patiently waiting for the BTR gasket question. I don't know what the gasket question is. Let's see. Because I was considering their small board gasket. What is your question about it, Tim? This will be the second time I've heard it. First time was on the stock Gen 3, this time Gen 4, but I'm learning a tuning game. You can definitely hurt it with tuning. With too much timing, it's not good. Calvin's engine does not have an intercooler. So is he running E85 on it or something? I don't understand why people don't run an intercooler. <laughs> The, the LM4 has a um, 706 or 862 heads on it, not the 799 heads, but an LM7 doesn't have those. Any, I mean, it has those same heads on it. And the the LR or the uh, LM4 is also a milder camshaft than the L33. But if you're going to change all that, none of that matters. Richard, I need a new Ford truck with a seven liter. I said this old one. <laughs> Push in one hand. There you go. On the text in the house. I'm going to change over to live chat so I can see more of what's going on. 68% are saying no, they haven't run nitrous on a carburetor motor. Yeah, an LM4 would be nice to find anything. Um, I have a bunch of LM4s. They're my favorite. Most people see the 706 heads and don't realize it's aluminum. You know, I probably fall into that group, Travis, now that I think about it. When I go check engines, I only check for, <laughs> only check the heads. I probably have walked by LM4s. What the heck did they have LM4s in? LM4 built during the transition years between Gen 3 and Gen 4. The 03 model had three different head bolt lengths. Okay, we got that. 2005 model is a beefier Gen 4 full floating rod. Doesn't have variable cam timing. Nice. So what are what what years are they using the? Trying to find what a 
assembly heads, small cams. So it's, it's aluminum headed LM7, right? But I'm trying to find out what. What combinations did it come in? I thought that they normally list that. And three small luck used in GM trucks between 2003 and 2005. Well, I see a lot of those in the wrecking yard. I've probably walked right by some, <laughs> some of these. Let's see here. I'm scrolling back, scrolling back. Uh, boosted 48. What, how did you get skipped? A bunch of LM4s are my favorite. Yep. I should have bought the Dominator instead of the Holly HP. HP is a good unit. Yeah, we, we run the HP a lot. In fact, I run the HP way more than I run the Dominator. Have you ever seen Ellis heads overhang the edge of the block a, a six one sixth of an inch? Is do you have um, do you have the the six bolt heads or something? Picked up an 06 aluminum yesterday. Top ring invested on four pistons and all four cylinders, four cracks. You did that purging it in the in the block? I mean in the pit. Uh, that was the other question. Richard, have you changed the oil barbell to the upgraded bill of one? No, I don't do that. <laughs> All of my stuff gets the original barbell that came with the, with the wrecking yard motor. Trailblazer is a major pain to pull out of the yard. That's why I find so many. The LH6 replaced it in 05. Long for the LS2. It's only 03 to 04 Trailblazer and Envoy. Eighth digit was a P. It's not in. It's not in other trucks, like 1500s. Probably needs to add dual O2 capability for the HP. I thought it has that. Does it only have one? There's a lot of guys around here that local to me that run Holly. That's why I figured I'd go with it. It, it does work, and, and it's easy to tune. So if my block came out of an 06 Trailblazer, well, it's either an L33 or it's a, um, I don't know about 06. I mean, you can measure the bore size, and that will tell you if it's an LS2. An L33 or an LC9. Terminator X have one. I think HP has two. Dominator definitely has two. I'm 
Yeah, Allen then so a, a thirty three or an LC nine that kind of thing. But it for it doesn't matter what that is. It doesn't matter what the engine designation is. It still does the same thing. Tim, you have an HP. It can only do one. Okay, we only ever run one. We we normally one run one from the dyno and sometimes one from the holly. And we haven't seen, obviously the ideal situation is to run 802 so you know exactly what each cylinder is doing. But short of that, what we'll do oftentimes is just switch it from one header to the other just to make sure that side to side balance is the same. Quite honestly, we, a lot of times we don't ever even do that. Like on all the last times I ran the, the L33 when I was doing all the cam swapping, when I had the issue with the cam retaining plate, uh, I never swapped sides. I, we just tuned it using one side and just assume that, <laughs> that they're the same. An 0553 all loom L86 Vin M Trailblazer. I'm still happy with the HP purchase <laughs> so from years ago instead of the SCT chip A9L. That's going way back. It's going back to the five liter Mustang days. I'm going to have to figure out something to do with my five liter Mustang when I put it back together. I actually really like the way that it drove on the factory computer. And, and a good mass air meter. When I do rings, I do the same top and bottom. I, I would like to have an aluminum LS in the Mustang. It'd be, it'd be a lot of fun. I have an L6 454 with oval heads and a G-body El Camino. How do you think we'll run with a 150 shot? It will run really good. Well, my question though is <coughs> why did um, why does the LS6 now have oval heads on it? Because it wouldn't have come with that. Station Road Rats. Channel has 243 heads that overhang the front of the block, 16th of an inch. Oh, it's a 16th of an inch. I thought you said a sixth of an inch front on the front on the back driver's side. I've never measured the overhang on it. I, I can look at the one that we have. Is the Chopper cam too big for a 4.8 for a daily driver? Um, you're gonna need a it's gonna on a on a stick car, probably not. And on an automatic car that's going to have a converter, it's definitely going to need a converter on a 4.8. eight. I can definitely say running dual wide bands, I can tell you the driver's side always runs a little leaner than the passenger side. So why why do you think that that would be? Yeah, well, it will definitely have a little bit of, it'll have idle. So whoever is asking the question about the overhang on the head, are you worried about something? Is it, is the engine running right? Does it, I mean, it's not something I would worry about. <laughs> Saw a shop tour of Texas Speed this last week from a guy picking up a small block. Those guys have uh, some big money and a huge facility. Yeah, they do. It's They're the real deal. I only bought the short block because the guy kept the rec board heads. Yeah. Those are, those are getting harder and harder to find. Marty, you have 80s in that. Those are good injectors. That seems to be kind of the go-to injector. In the tank, well, we're 400. It's 
There's 67% saying no, that they have not. So we're going to end our poll right there. 2.2 dogs progress. I haven't been back down there, so I haven't tried to run it again. When I go back down, we're going to try to run it. I'm going to try to clip the trigger wheel and see if we can um, get that signal to be accurate. If not, then we'll have to put a like a front mount trigger wheel on it, which I didn't want to do. I like the I like the Super Richie distributor mod. <laughs> Got me with the Pontiac and thumbnail. That's right, Thumper. I forgot about that. It is the um, is that the Pontiac? I don't think that's a Pontiac. I think that that's a, um, isn't that a 440? I thought that that was, I thought that that was Freiburger's 440. Okay, it's five and a half pounds of fuel pressure as it comes into boost. It, it should go up. If you have a, a a uh, boost reference fuel pressure regulator, it should go up one, one pound of fuel pressure per pound of boost. And initially you're going to see a change because you're going at idle. And when, uh, when you have vacuum, it, it also pulls fuel pressure away. It drops with, it drops with vacuum and, and increases with boost. I put 70 close chamber heads on it. It's 11 to one. That's good. So is it a, what, what, um, what oval port heads do you have on there? Are like, are they, are they an 049 or something? at an 89 IROC. Uh, Turbo 14 2.2 saw a comma on narrowing the signal. Yeah, what I'm going to do is it has the four pulse um, trigger in the distributor and they're fairly wide. So what, what we're going to do is try cutting them in half or cutting 70% off of them and make that smaller. So it doesn't, I, I think it's having a hard time with the signal. So we're going to try and see if that works. What size stall do you recommend? I don't know what vehicle it is, but you know, 2,800 or 3,000 probably seems to be the right number. Uh, Admiral, so you had a brilliant idea. So I, I'm hoping that you test it. Set up two dry nitrous systems, but one runs propane instead of nitrous for a propane wet shot. So through the plates, you're wanting to run propane in it? Through the second plate, you're are you running propane through both the nitrous and the fuel side? And then what are you running through the, you're running nitrous through one of the sides and then are you running fuel also through that? So I don't, I don't understand what you're trying to do there. <clears throat> So you got you got four openings. That was five. <laughs> you got four openings for distributing nitrous and or fuel. And if you have two if you have two plates, so what are you supplying in each one of those four ports? Uh, Marty, on your on your fuel system, does your fuel system go up at a one-to-one -one rate with boost? So if your static idle pressure is 58 PSI and you're running 10 pounds of boost, <laughs> you should have uh, 10 more pounds of fuel pressure on top of the 58 PSI. So you should have 68 pounds of fuel pressure or whatever your math is, whatever your starting point is. They came off a of 70 LS5 454. I forgot the casting number. They have 106 CC chambers. If you have a wet plate, just run propane. So why are you wanting to run propane instead of fuel? And then what is the ratio of propane 
to nitrous? Like how much propane do you have to run relative to the amount of fuel that you'd have to run? Building a return fuel system for a two valve Mustang. We've run both of them and even up to fairly high horsepower, there really wasn't the change. Uh, diesel pull tractors run propane. I know, I mean, I know performance guys do propane and I think it's fairly high octane. It's probably good for cooling too, I'm guessing. I just haven't, run, I haven't ever run propane, propane on anything except for that one video that I have of that startup of that, uh, what I think was an Atlas motor. I like E85 rather than propane. The guys do that too. And guys also run just some kind of race fuel with the nitrous. And they're only running the race fuel from a separate tank and pump and assembly when they activate the nitrous, which, which I think also probably works. I would like to try propane. I'd like to run that. The, the, the gentleman that I did the videos with um, that lives close by uh, had one and he has mixtures and stuff that he said we could try. Propane and diesel, yeah. They're, uh, propane injection on a diesel engine because you're fuel limited whether they're throttled by fuel. So if you add fuel, that could be propane, that could be nitrous, that could be methanol, it could be almost anything. And you can add lots of power to diesel stuff. Uh, JPL. Yeah. If you, the problem with having too much pump and not enough regulator is you don't have an accurate static fuel pressure. In the seventies and eighties, we ran propane on 390 powered FE or F two fifties on the farms a lot cheaper than gas back then. That's good. Pro propane is clean. Does ring gap make piston slap? No. It will, it will, ring gap is not going to change the distance between the, the 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 dimensional distance between the piston and the cylinder. <laughs> so Marty, so now we're getting now we're getting to what the issue is, Marty. So that you should have started with this. So. You usually run 10 and a half pounds, but I turned it up a little bit and it hit 16 pounds. That's when all my problems started. I, I think you probably heard something. Richard, do you have any AMC V8 videos? No, but I would like to. Boosted 4.8, when choosing valve springs, does my can lift need to match the, the spring's lift or does the spring lift need to be higher than the can lift? I'm confused. Yes, it should be. If you have a 600 lift cam, you need a valve spring that will not coil bind at 600 lift. It needs to coil bind. It needs to be able to run 630 or 650. A lot of guys have springs that are quite a bit bigger, like they run a 650 or 660 lift spring and they only have 600 lift. That's not really necessary. Um, usually... If you have a cam that's 600 lift, they'll have a spring for you. So get something that's close, because the closer you are to coil bind, you want to be around 30, 30 thousands or so from coil bind, but that's not critical. If you have a 550, like if you have a 550 uh, lift cam and you have a 600 lift spring, it's still going to work.
Google says propane has a higher octane rate than gasoline. Yeah, we think that that's true. I believe my setup works very efficiently if I can get the tuning side down. Yeah, you just need to have less timing with, and if you have questions, there are tuner guys here that can help you out. On system somebody else set him up with, just confused. I thought all boosted fuel systems should be returned. It doesn't matter. We run uh, all of our, all of the big bang motors that made 1500 horsepower or whatever. Um, all of those were not return systems. They were they were deadheaded going into the fuel rail. Do you think I could run E up to 40% on evil energy dash six AN stuff? I don't know what evil energy you're talking about. And and <clears throat> are are you are you worried about a flow rate thing there, Honda Tech? What what is your question about? Propane is much more for the same amount of fuel versus natural gas. Okay, we're running stock piston clearance. Last engine had a lot of side loading. Yeah, the you can put heat. You're putting heat in. As you turn the boost up, you're putting more heat into the piston. So you're going to have more growth. So you typically um, high boost turbo applications have more piston to wall clearance. And they also have more ring gap. All right, Scott, we'll see you. Todd, Richard, sorry, uh, I'm trying to get past the loss of my dog. And no, it's tough, man. I'll be getting out of bed today and taking steps. You need to get up and move around if you can. If, you're, if your health allows you to do that, you need to get up and move around. Um, it, doing exercise produces endorphins, and it will make you feel better. You will, And you will be better. Everything about it is better. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. So you're worried about the, the non, uh, E rated fuel lines and stuff. Yeah. I, you could do it for a while, <laughs> but, but not forever. Uh, JPL on the dyno, we do have a regulator. The pump, the, the pump doesn't, doesn't just feed the, the, um, the pump doesn't just feed the, the fuel rails. The pump feeds the regulator and the regulator bypasses, but then the regulator feeds the fuel rail the way, is the way that we have it set up. All right, my, Marty, let us know if we can help, but do do a leak down or compression test and see if you have a broken one. That's the first thing. I have a 327 with a 292 lift that wasn't built for nitrous. Uh, 292 is, doesn't sound right. That sounds like duration. But if you have a 327, a cam 327, you can run nitrous on it. Uh, JPL for the we on our five liter Mustangs, we didn't run deadheads on them. On the on the street, we ran, we fed the rail with the pump and then had the regulator at the end of the rail and then bypass on uh, after that. And so the regulator set, set up the fuel pressure in the rail 
but you have to make sure that if you have a lot of pump, like let's say you're trying to make a thousand horsepower and you have a thousand horsepower pump, your regulator has to be able to bypass a thousand horsepower worth of fuel or almost a thousand horsepower worth of fuel because at idle and stuff, you're not using any, hardly any fuel. So the regulator has to be able to bypass all of that. And that's a lot. And that's a problem for a lot of people. They just put a regulator on there and they set it and they go, oh yeah, look, it has all this pressure. Yeah, it does. Until you go into boost, then it doesn't have any pressure because it really doesn't have any static pressure. All it has is a whole bunch of flow from the pump overwhelming the regulator and it can't bypass it. So you have artificial pressure built up in the rail. And then now <laughs> when it's using that fuel, the, the actual static pressure was never set right. I think propane does have a cooling effect for boost. Two more minutes. Happy to help, Marty. And whoever said that they were going to be running their turbo thing at 25 pounds, good luck. Let me know what happens, obviously. Oh, I got to see what, I got to see how my stocks are doing. Ah, man, I missed all the big climbs here. You are going to keep going up, aren't you? Yes, you are. Who's my little climber? Tesla's way up. Amazon's up. AMD. Up in that neutral zone, I like to call it. Tell, oh, you are you are up in an area that you are going to keep going on. I would say you should keep climbing. So what do you guys think? Should I buy in on Intel? Should I go in strong? I'm going to think, I think it's going to keep climbing. We got strong buys at 49. Okay. <laughs> yes, go in on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I am not buying IBM. Uh, the four stocks that I look at that I usually trade during the day, uh, one is Tesla, one is AMD, one is Amazon, and the other one is Intel. Not because I care about any of those, but because those are big movers. So we have big swings during the day. And the way that we're trading, the way that we're day trading is that we can make money as it goes up and we can make money as it goes down. So all we care about is it's moving around. I hate doing my taxes. <laughs> That's very common. And on that note, it is time to go. But thank you guys all for showing up. I will be back tonight, and I'm working on another video, so trying to get lots done. Go get your projects done. Morning motivation. Bear, 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 bear.